This is the Puck Junk Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. I'm Sal Barry, and with me is Tim Parrish and Clemente Lisi. And today we're going to discuss hobby terms we hate. Yes, this is going to be a fun episode of uh, three middle-aged men yelling at the youngsters with their bro cases to get off their lawn. Maybe not all of that. I mean, you know, we're, we're also about hobby positivity, but I think this should be a fun episode, so stick around. We're also going to talk about how many Connor Bedard Young Gun rookie cards have been graded. The answer may surprise you. We'll also talk about some of the upcoming guests at the Sport Card Expo Toronto and the Sport Card Expo Edmonton, and maybe about the possibility of like, hey, could there be college hockey cards now that there's the whole NIL thing and we have March Madness basketball cards? Could college hockey cards become like a real and possible thing? So yeah, lots of cool stuff to discuss. Gentlemen, how are you? Clemente, we'll start with you today just to mix it up. All good. You mentioned March Madness. I watched a lot of March Madness, so I spent a big weekend watching a lot of sports. March Madness, uh, I watched the Rangers win against the Panthers in a shootout, and uh, I went to a soccer game with my daughter, so I'm just recovering, which is hard to do when you're starting the work week. Yeah, sounds like a fun uh, last couple of days. Uh, Tim, how about you? I am no longer allowed legally to answer for myself as I've sold all name, image, and likeness of myself and all social media to the highest bidder. So they'll have to answer for me. Yeah, I, I think the highest bidder was Elf Pogs, right? Hey, I'll trade for an Elf Pog any day. Like, like that episode of The Simpsons where... He's back in Pog form. Yeah. Remember Elf? He's back in Pog form. No, I'm good. You know what's funny about that is my son the other day, I mentioned like, things that were popular, like Beanie Babies and Pogs. And when I said Pogs, he goes, oh, yeah, that was in The Simpsons. And I was like, <laughs> oh. So it's kind of funny how like sometimes something that's from our childhood is one removed to a younger generation because they saw it somewhere else. So when you mentioned, now not this is like twice in like a matter of a span of short, a few short days, which is kind of funny, but yeah. Our childhood now, our life is basically like, oh, I saw The Simpsons 15 years after. No, but it's funny how you learn about stuff because, I mean, to me, like, I only know classical music from, like, the Bugs Bunny cartoons. <laughs> da, 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 kill the wabbit, right? Years later, I find out, oh, no, that's, like, a famous, like, Mozart uh, or whomever, right? Beethoven or... Well, that's like the episode in Seinfeld when Elaine says to Jerry, all your knowledge of the opera comes from watching Bugs Bunny cartoons. <laughs> so that's that's true. Yeah, that that's that's totally relatable, at least to me it is. Yeah, so uh let's let's get to it then. So uh yeah, we're we're not gonna talk too much about Connor Bedard just because we've tend to talk about him a lot over these past couple of weeks because it's just become this all consuming juggernaut. But Tim, what do you want to tell us about the amount of graded cards? By the way, I wrote an article about how Bedard's young gun has just been on the decline in value, just as more and more are entering the market. And like it, like a lot of people agreed with me, but I got like a lot of nasty comments like, do, do you even know about collecting cards? And you must be new to collecting and stuff like that, which I thought was funny. Like, you know, but whatever. Anyway. Uh, so yeah, so uh, PSA ten, PSA graded, BGS graded, Bedards. What's what's the skinny on this? Because this is a related topic, I'm just going to address that right right here and right now. Oh okay. So all of the backlash from that whole entire thing. So a, it's a lot of people commenting that didn't even bother to read the entire thing, and they just look at their 160 character headline and they go on from there. And then they make comments because they think they know what they're talking about. Those that claim to have read it, that were still commenting. The simple point they were trying to make, and I understand, was that if there are any selling for that low, there must be a problem condition-wise, which is a good transition over to the graded aspect of things. However, none of us made any comment or 
purported to say that one was better than another and a $900 one was better than a 500. We were simply saying, look at what's sold and you're going to see some have dipped below 500 bucks. In fact, just the last couple days on Twitter, I've seen people trying to sell them, posting them for $600. Then the next day, same post, 525, then 500. So it's like, you can't come at us and say, we're being disingenuous and all of that kind of crap. No, we're not. We, we never said anything about grade, about condition. We never broke things down or anything like that. I mean, you want to you want to get into it? Let's get into that whole thing. Look at how some of these things are coming out, and you can see how the centering is off. Well, that to some people is a big no-no. But guess what? When you look at the definitions on PSA for what's allowable for modern cards, they have like a 60-40 split. 60-40 to me is a lot. Like that's significant to see that because the the human eye is going to immediately go to it. And especially on a card that has reference points. And if you look at the picture that they use for the Bedard Young Gun, there are reference points. You have people in the crowd. You have dasher boards. You have the brake line in the glass. You have letters on the on the actual dasher boards. So you can see as they get further back and forth from the edges of the card, how centered the card actually is. You know, it reminds me, and I even made this comment before, it reminds me of the 0506 Young Guns because they all said rookies in the bottom. And you'll see various versions all graded high number, nines and tens and everything else by the various grading companies where the S's are varying degrees of being cut off on the edges of the card because rookies goes from, you know, from about the center of the card all the way to the edge. So if the whole S is there versus part of the S is missing, this happens. I get it. But we weren't commenting on that. Now we're going to comment on it because the set's been out. What are we at now? Three weeks? Yeah. Yeah. So three weeks now. We've got all of these that were immediately whisked out of their packs and packaged up and sent off to the varying grading companies because we got to get them in slabs, right? This is the most important card ever created on the face of the planet. We have to put them in slabs for archival purposes, strictly archival purposes, or trying to scam people out of a ton of money. Either way, whatever comes first. So I took a look at where we were at kind of volume wise, as far as what was sent out. Um, I looked at PSA. I looked at Beckett. Shockingly enough, people still grade with Beckett. And I looked at SGC, which I don't know how much longer that's going to last considering collectors bought them and you already own PSA. So you're going to keep them both around. They claim they are, but whatever. Care to venture to guess just, just with PSA. Anybody want to take a stab at a number that they already know? When you mentioned it, a number came to my head. I'm going to throw it out there. I could be totally wrong. Now, keep in mind, this is a three-week-old product. You yeah. have to send it to PSA. Right. It has to go through that whole process. We all know how that works. So unless you're doing Uber Super Express rate, you know, to get it back in this quick amount of time. Go ahead. Let's I say, I thought 3000 Ooh. Wow. 3000 so I, I'm going to guess this is like Price is Right, where I say one, one dollar, right? And the, the closest without going over. Yeah, right. You will be coming on stage uh, if you guess a dollar. I will tell you that. So I, I, I would guess probably my, my guess without looking up anything, just thinking back to like about how many listings and this and that the other. I'm going to say 600. 600 Bedards have been graded by this point. We're like three weeks and the product's been out and it had to be sent and stuff like that. And there was like a frenzy those first couple of, well, the first week especially. So uh, 600 is probably still too high. But, uh, yeah, I'll just stick with it. That's fine. So would you say 3,000 and I said 600? 600 is a very good guess. It actually is a, a very good guess. Woo, woo. Um, so you pull the pop report currently right now. And... PSA alone has graded just this base young gun 657 times and given it a grade 
if you want to add the four more that just got slabbed, we're at 661. So let that sink in for a second. 661, a three-week-old product. That's how many young guns have been graded at just one grading company. 661. So the 3,000 number at this rate in three weeks, in three months, 3,000, easy. I mean, at that, at that rate, that, that's an easy number to hit. In three months. Imagine where this is going to go, you know, in the grand scheme of things. This could very well end up being the most widely graded young gun card ever. I think right now, I, I think the McDavid probably has got a ton, but I, I don't know what the number, I haven't looked up that number, but here's the thing. So 657 were graded by PSA. We want to throw the other numbers out there just so we're fair and balanced reporting. Beckett, 48. So even Beckett, who no one sends cards to supposedly anymore, if you believe what you read on social media, they've even graded 48 of them. If you look at SGC, they've graded 35 of them. So between all three of the big guys, I guess we're calling these big guys, 740 Bedards have been graded thus far. 740. So that may surprise some people. It may not surprise another. But we're teetering on the 800 mark. And we're three weeks into this whole thing. So here's the more alarming thing to me. And I bet you can guess what I'm going with. How many of that 657 or 661, whatever you want to call it, at PSA do you think got put in a 10 what would be your gem rate okay i want to say half so half of the 600 like maybe 300 but here's the other thing too i think what happens is is i think that companies like psa become afraid of giving too many things tens because the tens become devalued if every card is rated a 10 then it doesn't mean anything. So then I feel like they have to start giving out some like nines and, and, and eights and stuff like that. Population control is what you're referring to. Oh, wow. I bet there's a lot of nines, more than tens and eights, nines. Because nine is like a safe number. It's not 10. It's not eight. Right. We didn't give it a nine. Yes, there are flaws. We're not going to tell you what the flaws but are. It's but... Not, right. But it's safe. Yeah. Right. Exactly. It's, Yeah. It's like when you grade papers and you give someone like an 85, it's like, yeah, you can't really argue with it. Thank you, Clemente. I was actually going to use that. Uh, I was <laughs> going to use that example. And I was going to say, if you go, eh, 90, yeah, they get a 90, right? Most students would be like, I passed. But you'll get that one student who's like, why did I get a 90? What was wrong with my paper? <laughs> and then you have to find things wrong with it, you know? <laughs> <laughs> We've all had that student. That's the problem with having to put a label on something that's subjective like that. You know, I don't think anybody that listens to our show has a thought in their head that I might be pro grading because I've made it abundantly clear that I think grading overall is a scam for various reasons. And this isn't the show for that. But what you were describing, Sal, as far as uh, essentially population control for fear of giving out too many of a certain grade. So then you start giving out other grades. Well, what does that say about the quality of the grade? Is it real or is it arbitrary? You know, are you hitting a quota because you have to hit a quota? Do you have to create this persona of, oh, we're the best grader in the world yet somehow, some way out of the box, they give out a billion tens and then they're like, oh, so, oh man, this is making this card go down and we're getting pressure from all our best graders and they're going to threaten to take money away from us. We better start giving out some eights, kind of help level that playing field out. Well, here's, here's a case. 657 slabbed up with a grade. 337 of them have gotten a 10. That's 51%. So I said half. 
wow, man, I am crushing it tonight. So you were like right on it. You looked at my notes when I wasn't no. looking. No, I, I, I haven't looked up any of this stuff. I'm just. I know. I don't, I don't take notes. What the heck? So, um, so yeah. So 51% of these have gotten, gotten tens, uh, ju- just out of PSA. Now, you know, again, to be fair and balanced, if we look at those 48 that Beckett did, they haven't slapped on with a black label, at least in their registry yet. But seven of their 48 have a 10 pristine and 33 of them have the nine and a half gem mint, which some people say nine and a half is the same as a PSA 10. I don't know. Then what's a 10? What's a BGS 10 then? A pristine. And what's what's a black label? Because I honestly don't know. Something that only that guy from Leaf always got. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know what distinguishes. Again, I'm not even going to get into that whole thing. But 33 and set. So that's 40 of their 48 are in a nine and a half or higher slab. And then if you go to SGC with the 35 that they've graded, 18 of them are tens. 18 out of the 35. So essentially, if you go look at this across the board between the major three, 50% or more are being called tens essentially is what that boils down to. So the chances, if you pull a Bedard young gun and you send it in, you have a 50, 50 shot that this is getting slabbed at a 10 right now, as we speak now, as this, as this broadens and we get a bigger sample size, when we get into Clemente's 3000, some we'll see if this is still at 50%, but I could easily see by the end of the Stanley Cup playoffs, us sitting here having the same conversation and having these numbers be very similar with the higher numbers, just for the simple fact that it is what it is. And this is the money maker. Like this is this is it. So here's the other thing. This isn't the only thing that's hitting, right? The bounty still hasn't been claimed. Nobody's hit the gold outburst yet, right? There's still the checklist card, which, believe it or not, PSA has graded seven of them. I don't understand why, but they have. People sent checklists in to be graded, whatever. Which, I don't know if you guys saw my tweet this week. I busted open that that one slab, that, that checklist slab I had. Cracked it open. It was professional level slab cracking, if I do say so myself. But that's another story. No, but PSA has graded the outburst, the regular Bedard outburst, 24 of them. If you can believe that 24 silver outbursts have been slapped. I didn't know that I had seen that many of those, but apparently 24 of them just went right, right to the greater. So, you know, take that information however you want, but that that's where we're at right now on that whole thing. So. Well, very cool. Thanks for the uh, the numbers on that. Uh, so real quick, I just want to mention some of the autograph guests that are going to be at the Sport Card Expo in Toronto and the Sport Card Expo in Edmonton. So the Sport Card Expo in Toronto is coming up April 25th through 28th. Unfortunately, I won't be able to make it there. Neither will Clemente. You're going to be there in the fall, right? Um, yeah, I'm aiming yeah. for it. Yeah, yeah, I, I am too. I mean, that's I, but I, I look at this and I go, wow, they have 22 hockey autograph guests lined up and the show is still a month away. So they might add a few more. And I noticed that they added a lot more less expensive autograph signers. And I think that's great because when you look and you go, oh, I want this guy's autograph. And it's like $79 plus Canadian tax, GST as they call it. And it's just like, oh, uh, okay, now this autograph, getting one hockey card signed is now going to cost me $88 or whatever, right? So looking at the, the Toronto show, so some of the hockey guests, or most of the hockey guests, so uh, they're going to have four of the six Sutter brothers there, and then the other two brothers are going to be uh, at a, another signing like a month later. So they're saying, hey, if you get something signed by four of the Sutters, you could leave your item behind, and then we'll get the other two to sign it. Uh, Pete Stemkowski is going to be signing autographs. Jaina Hefford, Dave Ellett, Thomas Caverly, Timu Solane, Stefan Riche, Felix Potvin, Al McInnes, Olaf Kolzig, Sam Montebo, Doug Favell, Gary Simmons, Dan Bouchard, Phil Meyer, Curtis Joseph, Dennis Hull, Bernie Nichols, and Billy Smith. So uh, that's the lineup 
for the Toronto show, then the Edmonton show, which is going to be May 3rd through 5th. It's a smaller show, but they still have seven hockey autograph guests lined up thus far. Ken Lindsman, Gary Unger, Eddie Mio, Yvonne Cornwaye, Kelly Bookberger, Dave Hunter, and if you want to count him, Sean Weiss, who was uh, Goldberg in the Mighty Ducks movies. He'll be signing for $60. Then I look and I go, oh, but Kelly Bookberger's 25 Dave Hunter's 25 Gary Unger's 25 Ken Lindsman's 25 Eddie Mio's 20 And I go, well, maybe I'd rather have th- those guys instead. But, you know, to each their own, right? Any of those autograph guests stand out to you guys? It's like, oh, yeah, I'd, I'd love to get their autograph. I think a cool piece would be if you could get that photo that they use for the 2009 masterpieces with all the Sutter brothers. Yep. Blow that up and get that signed. That would be awesome. Yeah, that would be good. Also, or the the book that was written about them, that would also be another great thing to get signed. As far as Ken Linsman, I know in his the, the Fleer throwback set from 0102, there's a photo of him. It's like a post-portrait photo of him in a Flyers uniform. And I believe he has like a plastic toy rat sitting on his shoulder. <laughs> that would be the card that I'd get signed. That or a rookie card or both, you know? So let's veer off into baseball because you guys piqued my interest with this baseball controversy because we think it could, I mean, hey, it's a sports controversy. If there's controversy in one sport, it might occur in another sport. So let's hear about this. I saw this last week. Everyone saw it. You know, Shohei Otani, who is, you know, the best baseball player of the moment and maybe one of the best ever, I'd say. You know, he he's a, you know, a pitcher and a hitter, and we haven't seen that since Babe Ruth. And as a result of the last few years, he's really blown up in the hobby. And the story came out that his interpreter and best friend uh, was tied up in some illegal bookmaking and with debts of over a million dollars. And so that story blew up, obviously, when the you know, it was connection to Otani. And my first my first thought when I read that was, wow, like. Like he spent a million over a million dollars gambling, which is that's a lot of losses, by the way. And then on top of that, he was stealing from Otani, right? That was the a report in the LA Times and ESPN. And then he was immediately fired by the Dodgers, uh, to Otani's new team. My first thought was, wow, that's not good for Otani, you know. And Otani's people originally seemed to want to defend him or at least try to help him, and then immediately did a about face twenty four hours later. And said he stole from us and, you know, we we're cutting ties from him. But all I kept thinking was, what if Otani is gambling on baseball? Or we now we see all the sports leagues are all in bed with gambling. Now, we're all old enough to remember that gambling in sports was like a big no-no unless you lived in Las Vegas, right? And now all the leagues are in bed with all these gambling companies like DraftKings and everybody else, you know, FanDuel. And I know people that are young in college were Young people gamble a lot on sports because they find it to be fun. Now, Otani has since said, you know, this person was a close friend of his had stolen from him. But I'm still thinking that MLB is investigating. And we all know Pete Rose is still banned from baseball for gambling. And so part of me thought, wow, if Otani is known to have done something wrong here, we all know how much money people have sunk into Otani in terms of his rookie cards, his autographs, his merchandise memorabilia. And so I took a leap from that and thought, wow, like is collecting the modern athlete a smart thing to do? That's the one thing I thought about. And the second part was something Tim and I were chatting about off air, which is all this gambling and professional sports, this is a natural thing that will happen. And so I'll talk a little about the hobby part. I thought, well, there's all these young hockey players and everyone's chasing Bedard and all these guys. And we always worry about an injury. Oh, if Bedard is injured, his value might go down. What if he's caught up in a gambling ring? What if he breaks the law? What if he's caught shoplifting? What if whatever? And people are spending thousands and thousands on these cards, especially in football and basketball and baseball. And it makes me think that As a collector, we should maybe just ignore the current product and just go after 
the older stuff, the vintage stuff, you know, basically, you know. No, no, (laughs) don't let them onto my secret. When I talk about pivoting, that's exactly what I do. Because if I'm not going to spend 600 or 500 or 450 or 350 or whatever for Bedard Young Gun, I'm I'm going to go after a, an old vintage card like Tim does all the time, where he'll find like old parkies for like yeah under a hundred bucks yeah. and of like Hall of Famers. Yeah, I sorry didn't mean to interrupt, but it's like no, you're giving away my trade. No, secret. but you're not. Gi- but we're not giving away a secret because those cards are not shiny. They're not of the moment. And so that's what people want. They want they have FOMO and they want the moment. They want they know they they're doing basically the story is it's not a hockey story it's, and it's not even a, a a hobby story, but it is because I think that buying Bedard or buying whoever Otani and and watching him, you know, it's like day trading. People are day trading on Comp C. They are. And so this gambling is a natural part of sports now, and the hobby has become gambling. It's very intertwined, and we've seen baseball players that two years ago were supposed to be the best thing ever, and then get caught up in sex scandals and other things. And now, or, or basketball players, they get arrested or whatever. And now I wonder if something happens to Otani. I mean, if you're a, a baseball fan or or a hobbyist, and you're in on, on Otani, you have to pray that he's not involved in this scandal because if he is, those values will collapse. And to me, that's a warning across the hobby of any sport you collect that this is a very dangerous thing people are doing. Look, prospecting is always a dangerous thing. You know, from from a monetary standpoint, is it a great idea to do? Depends on how you play your cards, uh, pun intended. <laughs> but here's the thing: yeah, this is a bigger this is a bigger story. This transcends all the sports, and we had our from a hockey standpoint, we had our test of this this year, right? Shane Pinto. 41 game suspension for sports wagering. Now, he he's tossed for 41 games. That hasn't happened, I think, when that came out and they they put that down, the hammer down on him. I mean, they said something like, We haven't suspended a player for gambling in since the 1940s or something like that. So here's the thing. They did the investigation, however, you know, that whole thing went down said, well, you know, he didn't gamble on hockey, so at least he's cleared for that because then we'd have to ban him for life or whatever. So they didn't do that, but still, 41 games. You see that, and you're like, okay, so what's the deal? You go and look at the NHL's collective bargaining agreement, and it basically says players are prohibited from placing bets on NHL games. doesn't say anything about whether they can bet on football or baseball or basketball or curling or full contact tiddlywinks. It says nothing about any of that. And you know for a fact that athletes gamble. I mean, it's well known and it has been well known. And if you think hockey players aren't gambling in the locker room and they all have fantasy football teams or even probably fantasy hockey teams for that matter, and they all put money on the board for various things all the time for different reasons, you'd be fooling yourself. Now, they came out after the fact, like after his suspension, and they were like, well, you know, he didn't bet. Somebody used his account to bet. Again, kind of what we have here with Otani. Well, they don't like proxy betting either, which is exactly what that is. You know, one party places wagers on behalf of, of somebody else, whether it's intentional or not. If you have access to somebody's account, why would you have access to that? Like, what's the reason other than to place bets for them? Oh, it's my interpreter. or It's my best buddy. He knows all my passwords. Really? That No, I, I'm not buying that. I'm not buying that for one second. So like from the hockey standpoint, so here we have this, right? They put down this giant punishment of 41 games. You know, he's since come back, but, you know, he spent the whole first half of the season, you know, riding the pine what is it, 39 out of 50 states in the U.S. have gambling that's been legalized now. And I think most of the Canadian provinces are essentially free to regulate however they want when it comes to that kind of stuff. But it's such a huge thing. And every sports league is in bed with every one of these gambling companies, whether it's an individual casino's uh, sports book 
or it's like the side sports books that have popped up. I mean, heck, Fanatics owns a sports book now. DraftKings, FanDuel, I mean, you name it. There's there's tons of them. Wayne Gretzky's the spokesman for BetMGM, for God's sake. And that's exactly what I was thinking. Like when Gretzky endorsed that, I feel like a part of me died. Yeah, exactly. Because I thought, wow, like, and look, it, is it no different than endorsing Coca-Cola or some other thing that's bad for you, whatever? But but it felt wrong. And, you know, I'm thinking why, you know, because Gretzky's name is Credibility. And I just thought the gambling firm has more to, you know, they're going to benefit from having Gretzky there. He's not going to benefit from, from being a, a spokesman for a gambling firm, a sports gambling firm. But that makes it legit. And that part of me thought, wow, that's, you know, and, and McDavid too. So, you know, part of me thought, wow, like, do these guys really need to do that? And this is the wrong message, I think. No, but they're taking endorsement money. So right. They're you getting know, paid. I mean, right. Look, I here, I, I break it down two ways. So here's what the NHL needs to do. The next time the CBA comes up and there needs to be something added or, or it has to be changed or whatever, and we're going to make a change to it. Something has to be put in there that actually clarifies what is and isn't allowed. Yeah, sure, you can't bet on hockey. Does that mean the games? Or does that mean any hockey? Because there's an awful lot of prop bets out there. Like, who's going to win the Ted Lindsay Award this year? Am I going to take a prop bet on that? Or does that violate the CBA? I don't know. I think it only talks about betting on games. Not only that, they need to extend to staff. You know, Coaches, I get, I get coaches and stuff, stuff like that. But trainers, you know, staff of the team, you know, people that have any type of influence or say so. Heck, break it down into into the even levels where you have people writing the press that's employed by the teams, like the announcers and stuff like that. There's got to be something that goes in. Think about it. I'm a writer for the team, right? I'm going to place a bet for who's going to win – the Hart Trophy. Guess who votes for the Hart Trophy? Sports writers. Right. What if I get a vote? Can I place a bet and also vote? See, it doesn't work. Right now you could. Right. Yeah, right now you could because there's nothing that says you can't. So on that end from the NHL, that has to be fixed. To the bigger question of whether or not we should go after prospects, I, I circle back around to that because it's like, yeah, we always say collect how you like, whatever prospecting is a huge gamble. You know, again, we're talking about gambling. Prospecting is a gamble. So not only do you have the boomer bust, you know, yeah, I want Bedard. He's great. He's lived up to all expectations. He's played most of a full season. We don't know what the long term is. I'm going to dump my all my money into Alexander Degg cards back in 1993, 94. And what's that going to get me? Nothing. A bunch of 10 cent cards that are worth garbage. Right. You know? But that's the difference. So like if we were living in 1988 and I bought 40 Greg Jeffries rookies and, and it goes bust and I paid a few dollars each or $10 each, even that's not a big deal. But when Bedard goes for 800 or 600 and I bought five of them and then the value goes down because they printed 8 million of those cards or he gets arrested for shoplifting tomorrow or whatever, or he's gambling on, you know, awesome. hockey. What happens? Then it's How like. How awesome would that story be? <laughs> Bedard arrested for shoplifting series two from Walmart. Oh my God. He claims he was chasing his own card to sell. <laughs> no, 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 no. The quote would be like, I heard Blaster sell for 45 on the open market, <laughs> says young superstar. Like that guy with the book bag with all the blaster boxes. Yeah, mega I saw blaster. that guy. I, yeah. I mentioned that. Yeah, with yeah. the duffel bag and the book bag. And he's like, right. any series two tins, you know. So what I'm, get, what I'm getting at is that, that, that the stakes are much higher. And I think that a lot of people that are new to the hobby are also people that are DraftKings people. They're also buying cards. I think. I don't know this for a fact. Yeah. But I think Gambler's going to gamble. Yeah, that's all. But that's the thing. It's a gamble. So you know what? I mean, honestly, look, if you buy 100 rookie cards of a player and that player tanks, whose fault is it? The player's fault or your fault? Well, that's Todd Van Poppel's fault, guaranteed. Well, no, it's it's your fault because you spent your money how you want to spend your money, and that's okay. I mean, like you say, collect what you like. 
I buy stuff. If I'm going to resell it, that's fine. You know what? If I don't resell it, you know what? I can think of worse things in life than being stuck with poor Sergei Bobrovsky young gun rookie cards that I thought were going to spike during the Stanley Cup final until his play kind of went in the opposite direction. And I said, ooh, I might have overpaid for these cards, right? But you know what? I still got four Sergei Bobrovsky Young Guns rookie cards, which I don't feel too bad about because he's still a damn good player. He's a beast this year. Yeah, and then there's and then there's playoff Bob, and then that's a different story. <laughs> but you know, I think I think regular season Bob made it into the playoffs because playoff Bob played during the regular season. But the point I'm getting at though is that when people say, oh, I spent a lot of money on this one of one and now the player got arrested for drunk driving, it's like, yeah, you know what? It's too bad that the player did a thing that was bad, but it's not you. It's not his fault that you bought that card and you overpaid for it and then he twisted his ankle and he's out the rest of the season and now he needs ACL surgery or whatever. You know what I mean? That's not the player's fault. That's that's how careers go. It's prospecting, it's investing, and people need to understand that they're taking a risk. Like, I almost feel like the gambling hotline needs to be on, like, packs of cards now, right? Got a gambling problem? Call 1-800-PUCK-JUNK for help, right? Like, just don't, don't call us, um, right? Because we'll tell you to collect what you like and, you know, not spend your mortgage on on trading cards. But that's the thing, though. It is gambling. And, and Upper Deck even says... On everything, if you read the fine print, they say we make no endorsement or promise of future value. You know, even though they'll say series two, home of the young guns, right? Yeah, Which, yeah but Sal, but then they say, well, we we don't guarantee any whatever. Okay, right? then that, that, that's true. But when I did my piece for for a CD on Bedard, upper deck people were more than happy to talk about you know, the value of this card and the excitement around it. And that's all hype meant to promote their product, which is fine. But they like the secondary market. Then they don't they don't benefit directly from it, but they do because they'll just print more of it. And we know fanatics want to get in the secondary market. They want to be part of it. So they have a, everyone has a stake in this hype machine. And I think that they're not benefiting directly but they're they're on the sidelines looking in what you know figuring out how can we benefit from this so you know every section of the food chain has a symbiotic relationship and that applies to trading cards too whether you're a lowly collector or you're the high roller and mighty manufacturer that's churning this stuff out and deciding what it is that they think you want Everybody has a job in this whole thing. Whether you like it or not, there's a job. It may be a crappy job, but it's a job nonetheless. And it all makes the whole thing work. So if we didn't have the people prospecting and paying $1,000 for the Bedard cards, think of all the content we would have lacked and had to come up with on our own for the last 10 weeks. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, let's find an old old peachy set to talk about. I hate doing research. You understand me, right? I just like opening, reading the headlines, and moving on. So, um, speaking of moving on, because I feel like we could talk about this forever. Oh, it'll come up again, trust me. Oh, it, it will, it will. But let's talk about college sports trading cards and if there might be college hockey cards on the horizon. I think it's fun to speculate. So now I just want to say a couple of things about prior to the whole name, image, likeness thing that college athletes now have. They have the rights to make money off of their name, their image, their likeness, which seems like a no-brainer. But, you know, you had EA Sports making NCAA basketball games and the athletes not getting a penny of that. And basketball teams making millions of dollars on March Madness, the players not making a penny of that. And them saying, oh, well, they got a scholarship. They got to go to college for free. That's their payment, right? Whereas it's so disproportionate one versus the other. Now, as far as like the reason why there haven't been a lot of college cards up to this point is because it had to do with players couldn't make money off of the cards. So a lot of times when you had college hockey 
sets, trading card sets, team sets, they were giveaways. So it basically meant that somebody had to sponsor the set and, and pay for it to be printed, and then they'd be given away. They couldn't sell them, like in the team shop, like they could maybe sell like a sweater or a jersey or whatever. I guess that's okay, but but you put a, a player on a card, and it has to be a giveaway thing. So that's why we've never had like an NCAA set with like all the teams, like we do with like the AHL or other minor leagues, or like or like a lot of team sets. You know, they're kind of far and few between. Like every now and then. When I see somebody selling a college hockey team set, I'll look and I'll see that they're selling like a bunch of them and I'll buy all of them because it's like somebody who just went to the games and like got the set every year. And and so anyway, so uh, yeah, I think it could be cool. So what are we seeing now with March Madness and basketball cards and how could this maybe translate into like the potential for like a hockey, hockey uh, college cards? Well, what's happening is that the last couple of years, people have been talking about, hey, it's March Madness, and like, why doesn't Tops now put out cards like in real time? Because to capture the moment. And I think Tops has heard that, Fanatics has heard that, and they've kind of merged their Tops now and their Bowman U into these packs they're selling on tops.com now for $139.99 a pack. And you get six base cards, one parallel, one autograph. And of course, people are chasing Caitlin Clark and some of these other big names because they are, you know, they're getting a lot of attention. That's really smart. And that's that's the fanatics hand that play here, you know. But it's like, why couldn't there be college hockey cards? Why can't college hockey players make money, you know, on their image and the likeness and everything else? And is there an audience for it? You know, I mean, there's an audience for minor league cards, at least early on in the career of the athlete until then their Young Guns card comes out and nobody cares about the minor league card. But people, some people still do. And so, so many, so many American players, American born players play college hockey. And there's like all these hotbeds of hockey, like Massachusetts and Minnesota and Wisconsin. And those would do really well. Not to mention across the country, people like us would be like, oh, this is really cool. It's a, it's a team set or it's, uh, you know, whatever, you know, um, it's a, uh, it's a special edition or, you know, and, and it's the kind of thing that tops can do. It doesn't need to be upper deck. It's not NHL related in any way. And so I think if basketball can do it, other college sports can do it. And I think other college athletes are going to want to do it. And I think there's an opening here for hockey. And maybe there's an opening here for some tops hockey or whatever. But it's interesting if there's an audience for it. That's the big question. And whether or not tops or upper deck would ever be interested in doing it. Remind us again one more time what what's the price of this print on demand card from Tops? One hundred and forty dollars for six base cards, one parallel, and one autograph guaranteed. Mm. You getting eight cards for a lot. Of, and I'm not saying that price point for hockey, of course, but you know, it seems a little steep. When you brought this up, I had no idea that Tops was doing that. First of all, but. I do have some knowledge of NCAA trading cards. And when NIL became kind of a commonplace a couple years ago, and it started gaining more and more prominence, there was a company called On It Athlete. You may have heard of them before, but they created a company that the whole entire platform was to bridge the gap between NIL licensing for the NCAA and the manufacturing of trading cards. And they started doing that through basically reaching out to the colleges and trying to bring colleges on board to sign off on that so that they could actually create trading cards that you know people really wanted and looked fairly decent. I have seen the Ohio State ones. I have seen the Boston College ones. I don't know who else they have, but I'm aware of those two. I believe, at least for Ohio State, they made a men's and a women's uh, for both of those. You used to be able to buy them from Walmart online. I don't know if that's still a thing because I didn't look it up, but I know the company's still around. 
and I did a real quick check on eBay and I found people selling them. So they're out there. But again, like you're saying, there isn't something that's widespread. So something like this is team oriented. So like Sal was saying, he finds somebody that went to a game and they had a team set that was made. He buys them up when he sees them because it's something you don't find very often. So if they made this more widespread and they made this available more to the public and more people knew about it, I think it might take off more. Is it going to take a company like a Tops to jump in and say, hey, we can do this. And Fanatics opens their wallets and says, money, money for everyone. Okay, great. Is that the gap that bridges Tops back into the hockey market? That's a funny, crazy thing to think about. Yeah, like like Bowman first hockey. That was my first thought. It was like, and we all know those Bowman first cards go for a lot of money. And and those guys, some of those guys never make the major leagues, right? right. Or they or they don't have great careers. So is it possible to put a, a attach a big name brand like Bowman to hockey, which would be you know tops, would be pretty pretty incredible. I think. Yeah, it, it certainly would be interesting. There just there has to be somebody that. It's going to act as the go-between to to offer up all the licensing for the NIL and and to kind of manage all of that going forward. Here, I just I just pulled it up. We'll have to throw we can throw a link in the in the show notes if we want to to this website. But they've got packs of twenty three twenty four Boston College NIL men's hockey. It's fourteen cards in a pack for twelve dollars and ninety nine cents. Or you can buy the Platinum Box, which has a guaranteed autograph in it. If you can believe that. $64.95. So that's more in line with where we're going with Blaster Boxes these days. But yeah, it says autograph card in 10% of packs, whatever that means. 14 cards per pack, 6 packs per box. You get 84 cards total. And that's the Boston College Eagles one. And it's for the hockey team, so... So that's one company that's doing it. Obviously, not every team is available. All your favorite teams that are out there obviously don't have it and aren't on board with it, but there are a few. So I think it would take a major player like a Tops or a Fanatics to jump in like that. It doesn't sound like something I could see Upper Deck doing. I think they they have their hands full with the NHL and doing the AHL sets and the CHL sets. And the PWHL sets. And now with the PWHL on board. And the Alumni Association. Yeah. So I, I don't know. I don't know that that'd be something else that they would jump in. But yeah, you're right. I think another company. No, I could see Fanatics do it, doing that because they're all about, you know, they sell a lot of college sports apparel, obviously, you know. How about a Leaf? Yeah. Uh, they can, if they can get the National Pickleball people to, to sign on, why not NIL for college? Okay, so before we move on. Oh, you thought I was kidding, didn't you? Because I'd like to move on to the hobby terms we hate. I want to just point something out really quick, and I want to thank our listeners because I'm looking at some of our statistics here. And get this, guys. For hockey podcasts in Canada, we've broken the top 100. We've actually were uh, ranked 89 now. This is in Canada. I know that means there's 88 other podcasts ahead of us, which is kind of... It's Canada, though. But this is in Canada. So, I mean, we're resonating with, with some listeners or a lot of listeners. And, I mean, when you look at, like, who's ranked above us, and I'm not going to, you know, read every single one, but you wouldn't be surprised. You would just be like, it's like the usual suspects, like, the spit and chicklets, like the 32 thoughts, those are the ones that are like getting like the one, two, three, four, five spots. And then you sure they're not motivated by sheer irony or out of spite. What do you mean? Don't you remember we had that one bad comment about us? Like the one bad one we ever got was like from the dot CA site. It was like, these guys know nothing about hockey. Yeah. Well, I have a theory <laughs> on who wrote that, but I won't name. Oh, me. Okay. Yeah, no, I'll tell you guys offline. We'll have to talk but, later about that one. Yeah, we will. But uh, anyway, our humble little hockey card podcast has uh, cracked the top 100, which is great considering that we're on a shoestring budget for both production and 
promotion. We don't even have the string, I think. We have the shoe without the, the laces. We're the Skechers slip-on of podcasts. Basically, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they're comfortable. That's right. <laughs> we're all over the age of 40. That's acceptable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We, we're like your favorite pair of warm shoes. Hey, if it's good enough for Tony Romo, it's good enough for me. Yeah. That's right. All right, let's talk about some of these hobby terms that we hate. Because, Tim, you wrote a really funny article about uh, some of the terms that people say in the hobby. Funny? It was supposed to be serious. It worked on two levels. So um, it was about terms that you want to see retired. So why don't we, like, we'll take turns. I got it. I got a good one. I got I got a good one. I can't wait to say. But yeah, let's, let's, uh, why did you, why did you start us off since this was your article that inspired the uh, topic of this podcast, Tim? What, what's, what's one of the, the, the terms in the hobby that you'd like to see go bye-bye? You know, we could talk about the ones that I quoted in the, the, the article. That's fine but... because people might not have read the article and, and yeah. continue to talk about and that. And if they didn't, I'm not going to go right after the big one because I think the big one is a is a pet peeve of a lot of people. But this one's certainly a pet peeve of mine. It's using that term true on everything because you want to make it seem like whatever it is, your item is so much better than everybody else's. So you call it their true rookie or their it's a true color match, or it's a true jersey match, or a true one of one. What does that mean? True. Like everything else is false. So if I have this card that's a one of one, uh, it's not a one of one. It's false. It's, it's, it's false one of one. How so? Please explain. You know what? You can't because there's no explanation. You're simply trying to designate something and give it a tag that you, to make you feel more superior than something else. And it's overkill and it's not needed and it's just extra to be extra. And I hate it. I hate the terminology. I don't know where it came from. I don't know why we started saying it and it needs to go away. Plain and simple. Yeah, I think that's true. <laughs> uh, I, I agree. You got me on that one. No, no, no. It's just, I think it's like when people say the true heir to the throne, right? Like this is the best one or the only one. And so when they talk about like a true rookie card, I I, I want to tell people to STFU because they don't know what they're talking about. Because like, you know, like why can't no peachy marquee rookie? I mean, people would say, oh, that's not a true rookie card. But then when you put Bedard's name on it, oh, people start losing their their stuff over it right so like it could be interpreted so many different ways and i love arguing with people who love like adhering i don't mind the people so much who are like oh only the young gun is the true rookie card because you know they they don't know what they're talking about yeah, they think they do they don't but like the people who want to really stick to those rigid rules that Beckett put out 40, 45 years ago. And I get that because some guy in his basement could print up a bunch of Don Mattingly cards and put a 1983 date on them or 84. I know his rookie card was 84. I don't know if he played for the, the Yankees in 83 and got a card in 84, if he played in 84 and got whatever. But the point is, is that the technology was starting to get there where people could print up their own cards, make their own phony cards. So there had to be some sort of guidelines in place. Like, no, it has to be from a real company. It can't just be some BS card that some guy printed on his you know, now they could do it on a computer printer and they look pretty good, but you get the idea, right? Like, I understand why there had to be some regulations, but some people get so hung up on those old regulations that it's like, you know, like, you remember those Bowman CHL sets from the late 90s? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. How come those don't count as rookie cards? Although Eric Lindros's card that pictures him as an Oshawa Senator, well, that came out in 9091 score, but why isn't 98, 99? Bowman CHL. Why isn't that? Why aren't those rookie cards? Right? Do, do you see what I mean? It's like major company distributed in packs, wide release. I mean, it, it checks all those boxes, right? So people want to get selective about what is and isn't a rookie card, and so the whole true thing is just it's ridiculous. But yeah, well, that's one of the things that I talk about in the article a little bit is that I flat out I blame the card manufacturers because. They've had eons to come out and clarify what is or isn't a rookie card. 
and it just becomes a giant fight at different times through different periods for whatever reason it's been one thing or another and no one can agree on it and no one can come to a conclusion as to what is what so we have a million different releases that all say rookie card so you can't say something is a true rookie card when there's hundreds of them that all say the same thing you can't you, you try to rectify the confusion with true rookie all that does is just make it more confusing clemente what about you do you have a term that uh, you would like to see go away or a term that you hate yes yeah, so the term was t- top of my list is exactly it's another way of saying what tim said but i hate the term xrc because because <laughs> really that is, yeah because that is exactly another version or variation which is a hobby term variation of of the true rookie card it's like well this was a baseball card that's in a traded set it's not pack pulled so it can't be the rookie card it's like well why not so to me the true rookie card is technically the person's first car as a professional and if in bedard's case that would be what the mvp in um redemption Right? Would it be? Yeah. Why is that not the true rookie card? Oh, but that's not pack pulled. Chronologically, it wouldn't be because the redemption came first, and he's not on it. So then it would be the OP, then it would be the marquee rookie. Then then the marquee right. rookie is. Oh right. no, it's the flagship one. Oh, but it's got to be from, but it's got to be pack pulled. Why is it part of the set? It can't be an insert. Right. It can't right. be the SSP one or whatever or SP one. No peachy glossy that's out of the packs. The insert. Right. And so XRC bothers me because I understand. So look, we either have to say to the people, look, Connor Bedard has fifty seven thousand rookie cards, or we tell them no because you got that sell right. People were asking you, and people don't really use the word XRC. I think people our age know what that is. People just were asking you sell the show. Oh, what is his real like? What what is his rookie card? That it was a sincere question. Yeah, I mean, a lot of people didn't know, and I explained to them, you know, that it's going to be what pictures him as a member of the Blackhawks, and then I go, here's a game dated moments card where he's pictured playing in a game for the Chicago Blackhawks. Did it come in a pack? Well, an e pack that had one card in it, and that was the one card. So I guess it depends how technical you want to get on it. Okay, so game data moment, would that be an XRC? I don't know. Why wouldn't it be an RC? And, you know, another thing, too, is that, like... How often does that get thrown around anymore, though? XRC? XRC? Yeah, because we don't really have traded sets as much anymore. We don't have, like, mail-in extra sets for all their extra rookies that much anymore. No, but, like, baseball has update. And that's packs, I get it. And and hockey has extended, and those are packs too. But then the other thing I wanted to say was like, we grew up where players had more than one rookie card, right? Like I have three different Ryan Sandberg rookie cards, me being a, a kid from Chicago and having a Ryan Sandberg rookie card meant something, right? And so I have his top rookie card, his Fleer rookie card, and his Donruss rookie card, right? And they're all rookie cards. I consider them all rookie cards. Which one's his true rookie card? All three of them are. They're they're all from his rookie year. They're all made by different companies. So there's room for more than one rookie card. Oh, man, sorry. I just hijacked the conversation. I'm sorry, Clemente. No, no, it's exactly the sentiment I have. And it's it's the kind of thing where it's like, I think a lot of people just ignore the rules or they have to, they feel like they have to follow the rules. And I think that's the case with Bedard because he's the, the flavor of the month. But Everyone chases the Young Guns card when the marquee rookie is just as good at a fraction of the cost and is a legit rookie card. And, it, you know, so to me, the manufacturers don't, you know, Tim is right. They, they've created the problem because they create more products. They need to make more money. I get it. But in doing so, then Beckett responded with, we have to make rules, even though there are no rules about other things. And so then it becomes kind of the Wild West and people make up their own mind and whatever. But it impacts the way we collect and it impacts the decisions we make and where we spend our money, what we talk about. And so in a lot of ways, it's frustrating. And so maybe the term XRC isn't used, but it's that cloud that exists that is annoying. 
And I don't know how if it ever goes away. I didn't mention to you guys once that in the soccer card hobby, because mostly European, a lot of them consider like the sticker to be, hey, if a sticker came out first or there was no card, that's the rookie rookie card. And so why aren't any of those stickers that you were selling, Sal, at the show, why aren't those legit? Because the hobby doesn't want them maybe, or they don't value them as much. But in other sports, they're highly valued. Yeah, it's like when I tell people that Brian Leach's rookie card is his 1988-89 Panini sticker or his 1988-89 OPG Future Stars sticker back card. And both of those predate his 89-90 rookie cards by a season, but nobody gets it. They're just like, oh, it's a sticker. It's like, no, but this sticker, the sticker came out a year before his rookie cards came out, right? But it's a sticker, right? So they don't like it. I mean, I wrote a piece for SCD about like mentioning Otani. Otani has Japanese league baseball cards that are really his rookie card, if you think about it. Ovechkin has Russian cards that are his real rookie. Now that Ovechkin card is not worth as much as the Young Guns, but he was playing professionally in another country and that card exists. I have one of those cards, yeah. And But no one's like asked When they say to you, do you have an Ovechkin rookie? They don't mean that card. They mean Young Guns. And so why isn't that card a legit rookie card? And it is. If you're, if you're an Ovechkin collector, you're going to be seeking that card out. But the rest of us are probably not. But I think it's cool that you can go pre-NHL, like that sticker you mentioned of Brian Leach or Ovechkin's rookie from the KHL or whatever it is, and and – blow someone's mind by saying yeah this is the real rookie card it's his first year in the league period i mean like my austin matthews card where he's with the burn lions right well it's a professional team professional player professional team but it's a team issue not a pack card so whatever i have the real true xrc market cornered with the 91 92 parkhurst bill garen rookie you own them all, though. I got 29 of them. Right. And I have one in my set. It's not all, but it might be close. Everybody knows why that's an XRC. It was a mail-in set. So, so all right, let me tell you my... Okay, this is the top of my list. I'm going to use both of these terms. They're different terms, but they go together. You ready for this? Okay, this is the term that I hate. Kind of makes me want to like hit something, you know, when I hear it. Pack fresh. And its brother term, case fresh. I hate that. When they say that this card is pack fresh, that means that they want to sell you a card that's 30 years old, but because they opened the pack yesterday, somehow they think that justifies them being able to sell it for more money. Like, oh, you want an 89 Ken Griffey Jr. rookie card or a 1990 Upper Deck Yarmer Yager rookie card? Well, this one is pack fresh. So it'll probably grade a 10 because I just pulled it out of the pack. And the one that you bought 30 years ago, that ain't pack fresh. That's, that's 30 years ago. That's stale gum, right? Or when they talk about case fresh, a lot of times they're talking about sealed boxes of cards that they want to sell for a premium not to name names but i'm going to name a name because they do this nonsense and i'm going to call it nonsense because i think it's nonsense da card world will take a hobby box that is in their terms case fresh and then they will encase it in like like a plexiglass holder and seal it so that you could sit on this box for 10 years. And by sit on, I don't mean actually sit on it to hatch it. That would be funny. I mean, like, hold on to this box and go, oh, look at this box of uh, a Series 2 from uh, 2324. Well, now they're selling for $800 a box because, you know, uh, Connor Bedard's young gun is in it, right? And so you have this, and it's case fresh versus just, Paying $330 for the damn box, right? Now you're I, I, actually, I don't even know if they're doing it with this box. All I know is that they'll take a box, they'll mark it up 30 to 50 bucks, and then they'll put it in a, a Lucite holder 
and it's case fresh. Let me ask this question. Mm -hmm. Back to the number of Bedard young guns that got graded. There were 264 nines. Are those pack fresh? There were 45 eights. Are those pack fresh? How about the three sixes that got graded? Were those pack fresh? I'm guessing they were. They probably opened them up out of a pack, stuck them in their little, whatever those are, card saver twos, and packed them up and sent them off. So, I mean, I opened this up out of a pack. What does that mean, pack fresh? That means this could be a 10. This could also be a 6. So what does pack fresh even mean? It just looks good. It has good eye appeal. So that why not just say that? Well, it's meant to. It's Sal said it, it was. It's meant to to make you want to get it for grading. Like that's the whole point. It's like well, you can grade this forty year old card because it's like brand new out of the thing. Even though the the box could have fallen on the ground or the packs could have you know been dinged. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, you know, but it's all meant for grading. It's it's meant for grading. It's meant it's meant for grading. That's what it is. 1991 is a bad example. That could be pack fresh. Like, I have a box right here. I could open right now and everything in it's pack fresh. Right. I mean, I have two boxes of pack fresh pro set cards that I opened prior to our 1991 pro set episode for research purposes, of course. Pack fresh. Pack fresh. So, Tim, why don't you hit us with another term? It can be from your wonderful article. It could be a different one. There's so many. Well, just pick one. There's so many. Again, I don't want to tap into this. So let me bring this one up. Holy Grail. Or Grail card. This bothers me. Grail bothers me. It bothers me for this reason. A Grail has some extreme significance. Because first of all, you have to be in the mindset that a Grail actually exists in the first place. A lot of people don't believe that the Holy Grail, where the term comes from, even exists. Some people don't believe it ever existed. So if you have something that supposedly exists, that a bunch of people don't believe it exists, and there's no proof that it actually exists, how can you say that a card is a Grail card if you then suddenly obtain it? Does the whole world change because of its significance? Absolutely not. Does your world change? Yeah, maybe. But that's something entirely different. And we throw this term around all the time. It's a grail. I got my grail. I got my grail. I put out a tweet the other day about my grail, achieving my grail card. And it was this uh, card that has Eric Tangrady on it turned backwards, dishing a body check to Jared Cowan. But it came from that 2014 Cryptozoic NHL game. So it's not even like a real card. It's like a playing card. And I was joking, and I used the term grail because I knew this article was coming out soon, and I wanted to see if anybody would pick up on it. So there, I just showed my ass and gave it all out there. But everybody throws that term around just so much, and it's just like, it's not, a, it's not a grail. And why should I care? I guess in the grand scheme of things, I don't care. It just becomes annoying because it's like you're slapping this bigger significance on something. White whale is another one. White whale is like... You know it exists. You just can't catch it. Like it, it's so rare and rarely seen, but people have seen it. You just can't catch it. That's different. That might be better suited as a term to apply to that card that you've been chasing after for so long and you finally obtained it. But I think the example I used in the article was your... Um, 8990 or 8889 Opeachy Bob Probert rookie card. That might be a really cool card that you've been chasing for a long time. That is not a grail card by any means. It's not even a whale card because guess what? There's tons of them and they're everywhere. They're easily obtainable. This isn't difficult at all. There's nothing difficult about it. It's not too expensive to get. It's not too scarce. It's none of that. And I think either of those terms get battered around too much way too much i think a lot of the people that talk about grail cards or whale cards <laughs> whales and grails they're usually talking about some sort of one of one patch auto card and so i think that's that's the thing is that like it exists but you almost never see it 
or it's out there. And that's the white whale. Right. It's out there somewhere, but it's elusive. And I think like with a grail, you know, that's funny. You were talking about this and actually that made me kind of think about like me. I have a grail and I have a whale. Do you care to guess what they are? I'm going to guess. Go ahead, Tim. I No, go. You don't want to hear my answer. Okay. These are going to be so out there. Oh, they're oh, they're out there. Okay. Well, okay. I I don't want to say too much because I thought it was I, like a, like a like a Bobby or rookie card would be like a Grail. No, I could get one. I saw three of them at the last show. I mean, if I whipped out my credit card and said, "Hey, do you take plastic? I'll buy that one for forty five hundred dollars," then I I could have it, right? Right, but you also got married. That's the thing. You know, like we, you know, like... <laughs> uh, he's got you there. <laughs> I don't know if I feel burned by that or not. Right? <laughs> no, you know no. I mean? Consider yourself lucky in the sense that, like, yeah, any one of us can do that, but it still would be a grail because it's it's out of reach. Or it's like, do you want do you want to put all your money on that? You know exactly. You know what I mean? Right. So, no, I don't want to spend four and a half grand on a Bobby or rookie card. I mean, no, or I like any card. One? Yeah, but I'm just not there. I'm not there. I'm not there yet. I might never be there. You know. Right. Right. It's yeah. It's a it's a crazy amount for one card, unless you're whatever super rich and. So the card that's out there that has eluded me, and I've been outbid on this card many times, is a 1984. 85 University of Minnesota Duluth Brett Hull card. Now, the one that you always see on eBay, that's the 8586 set. The 8485 set was allegedly printed like maybe 300 sets or 500 sets. It had a very small print run. The 8586 UMD Bulldog set, again with Brett Hull had a very big print run. You could still find that set for $20, $30 or the Brett Hall for $20 or $30 ungraded. So to me, that's the white whale where it's out there. I've seen it. It'll show up. It'll disappear. Some guy that lived in Minnesota had the set. He emailed me. He was going to sell it to me. I said, yeah, what do you want for it? I threw him an offer. He didn't get back to me. I said, no, I really want this. And you had some other things that I wanted. And then a guy just ghosted me. So I I don't know what happened. This was like 10 years ago, but I got so excited. I thought it was going to finally happen. As far as the grail, because we don't know if a grail exists or not, right? Like the Holy Grail is a mythical thing that we think exists, but maybe it doesn't exist. For me, it would be the 1989-90 Tops Randy Cunningworth error card which I am still not convinced that it exists. It was written about in the first issue of Beckett Hockey Magazine. Tim found an image of what it looked like a few years ago, I think on like a Com C listing or something, but I've never seen this card in person. I've never pulled one from a pack, obviously. I've never met anybody who's seen this card. I've even talked to one person at Beckett who said, yeah, the card doesn't exist. I've talked to another person who used to work for Beckett who says, oh yeah, the card does exist. And then actually I talked to a third person who worked for Beckett and said, no, the card doesn't exist. So I can't even get a clear consensus. But to me, I just want to know if this damn thing exists or not. And then I can just scratch it off my list because it's been on my list for 30 something years now. That's a great example of a, a grail card. Thank you. It's a great example of one. I just want to know if the damn thing ever actually got printed, and I don't think it did. Bunch of people think it exists. The other people think it doesn't exist. We don't know because we've never seen it. It's a hockey card urban legend, you know? I yeah. love it. But it also drives me nuts. So if one appeared someday, it will change Sal's life forever. Myself, I'll be like, oh, cool. <laughs> and then we'll move on for life. No, because it has. A, you'll be like, oh, crap, that has a Penguins logo on it. Now I need it. yeah i'm over that whole pipe dream of thinking i'm ever gonna get one of every card because i have it no but but it's it's the chase that keeps us going that's right absolutely all right so you said whales and grails clemente how about you 
Well, I have to say, I don't, I don't hate Grail or the Grail card. I don't know, you know, why. <laughs> so I don't necessarily agree. I think Holy Grail. It's overused. It, well, it's a well point. in writing that we call the cliche. Like you overuse a term, and that's you know, you know, yeah. so that's true. You know, I don't have as many pet peeves about some of these terms that you guys do. I mean, I, when I was at the Chicago show, I thought we should retire. It's not a term, but it's a name for something, which is penny sleeve because they cost $5 a pack now or $2 a pack. I'm like, they're not a penny each anymore. They're just sleeves now. And I, it's, you know, because I was going to buy one and the guy wanted $250 for it. I thought $250. And then Sal was very nice enough to give me like six of them that I needed. And I'm like, penny, we still call them penny sleeves to denote they're cheap. But we all know during the pandemic, everything plastic went up in value, you know, cost more. And now on Amazon, I think you can get, you know, 10 of them for like $15 or something. It's out of whack. I understand things cost more. There's inflation. And penny sleeves have cost, a, you know, a dollar a pack for what, 25 years, whatever it is. Forever. Forever. I mean, they were penny sleeves. I think we should call them nickel sleeves or... Soft sleeves, nickel sleeves, because, you know, maybe they don't cost a nickel, but nickel sleeves just kind of has a nice ring to it, like penny sleeve. Also don't know that they were ever called penny sleeves on the on the actual packaging. People call them that, but they're just called plastic sleeves or sleeves. And like that bothers me more. But like in a Larry David kind of bothers me, like it's just it's not the biggest deal in the world, but it is annoying because I assume it's a dollar. And it's not. I went to a, a card sh shop, oh, maybe a couple of years ago. I got a couple of cards that were loose, like in a box, and they added up to like nine dollars, I'd say. And then I was like, "Oh, I have a ten. I was like, "Just give me that one pack of paint sleeves, and we'll call it even." And the guy goes, "Nope." Like just like that, he was like, "Nope." I go, "Why not?" He goes, "Well, the paint sleeves are a dollar fifty, and I'm gonna charge you tax too." I'm like, "Oh." And it was like twelve dollars and change, and I felt like weird. And so I don't know. I think penny sleeves builds up an expectation that isn't realistic, and it's just bizarre. And I just feel like we have to get rid of that. Well, I remember during the pandemic, I was at Target, and they had like ultra pro soft sleeves, and they were something like. 500 sleeves for like maybe 699 or something. I think now they're down to about 500 sleeves for 599. I mean, I don't always price out supplies when I go to Target, but sometimes I'm just curious what these things sell for cuz I feel like if you're buying card supplies at Target, you're either a little kid who doesn't know any better, you're an adult buying these for a little kid and you don't know any better. Or you're just really hard up and you just need the supplies. Kind of like when you go to a liquor store at 2 a.m. to buy a six pack. Because the bar is closed, but you're not done drinking. So you're going to overpay for that six pack from the mom and pop liquor store that's still open at like 2 a.m. or 3 a.m. or whatever, right? So, you know, and the people who know, like us, we're just like, I'm not going to pay $6.99 for $500. And, and one thing I did during the pandemic was there was a, a, a company, I don't think they're around anymore, but they were a, like a new hard supply company. And I actually negotiated with the guy to get the soft sleeves for like basically a buck a pack. I had to buy 200 packs of them. So I tied up 200 bucks, no tax, no shipping. 200 bucks, got my 200, 100 sleeve packs and uh i got enough penny sleeves to last me a long time i still have a lot of them man clemente i'm sorry i only gave you six i would have given you a pack if i knew you were that hard up for them i think one time for kim's birthday i think i sent you like 10 packs of penny sleeves or something during the pandemic because like i just had so many of them but i'm just like no i don't want to pay 2.99 for a pack of 100 right so you were you were doing like you, you did the the toilet paper hoarding on on penny sleeves at the, that was you. Well, kind of, but the thing was was that I I reached out to the guy, and I also bought a bunch of top loaders. Now those I got hosed on 
because what I paid for those was probably close to four dollars a penny. Now that's the other thing too. That the flip side of this whole penny sleep thing is that I haven't bought a top loader in, in a long time because every car is in a top loader now. And I have so many cards that I just put in sleeves in boxes and then I had the top loader. Every card I buy on eBay comes in a top loader. I put it in a one touch. So I have extra top loaders. So I I have a ton. Then you gave me a bunch from the national. So it's like I have so many top loaders. And I never thought I'd live in a world where I have more top loaders than penny sleeves. But here we are. So I can confirm I'm looking at three different brands, three different packs here. They all just say card sleeves. That's the Ultra Pro. That's the Shield Titan. And that's BCW. They all say card sleeves. They don't mention pennies. Nobody ever advertised that way. Yeah. It only got the name because they were 100 in a pack and they cost so they were, a box. It was they jargon. Penny a piece. Yeah. Penny sleeves. Right. It was just, yeah, yeah just yeah. jargon. So while we were sitting here, you brought up one that you inadvertently brought up one that I was thinking of that I Do didn't it. say yet. But if you've got a better one. Well, I could just throw mine out real quick and then we will go back to you. These terms are used kind of interchangeably. I don't like either of them. And uh, they are sick and nasty when referring to a card. Like, oh, that is a nasty patch, bro. Right? That is it. Oh, I mean, I could, I, I can't go lower than 150 because uh, that is a nasty patch, right? That's what the law we say when you're like, oh, I like that card, but, you know, it's like numbered out of 149 and it's not a rookie card. And, you know, I can you go, oh, no, that's a nasty patch, right? Like, that's their way of saying that piece of patch is good because it has a lot of colors or whatever, right? And then when they talk about sick, like sick RPA, bro, right? Like, they're, they're talking about a rookie patch auto and not a micro brew. Isn't that an RPA? Rookie patch auto, yeah. No, I you're thinking IPA. Oh, you're thinking IPA? Oh, yeah, okay. I sorry. Yeah, see, I, I'm I'm so, so such not a drinker. I'm like, you know, an RPA, like the micro brew <laughs> beer. No, I, wow. What would an RPA be? Like IPA is India Pale Ale. RPA. I don't know if there is one. No, IPA. That's yeah. that's what it is. It's, it's yeah. Okay, so I, I'm no, but there's APAs too, like American Pale Ales. There's, uh, okay. There's okay, other okay. things. So that's why I'm wondering what an R would be, like a rye pale ale. Would that be something? No. I understand that, like, I mean, I'm old enough to remember sick being a slang term meaning cool, which is what it is. You know, like, oh, that's sick, bro, right? Like, that's cool, right? Unless something was actually sick. It depends how you say it, like, sick, right? Like, or, whoa, that's sick, right? It's all about your intonation and all about context, right? Like, saying something's, like, the shit, means it's great versus that's shit, which means it's awful, right? So it's all about context and how it's said. But like, I don't know, just whenever like people talk, use sick and nasty for like card terminology, it's always just some bro talking about some card that he pulled in like a box that he bought like yesterday and it's, it's pack fresh, it's case fresh and it's sick. Get off my lawn. <laughs> Told you. This is going to just be a bunch of 40-somethings complaining. No, no. I just like it that it took a while, but we got to the bro case people. Like, boom. Like, we got there. It took a bit, but we, we got I know, there. man. They're living rent-free in our heads, man. Gets... They really are. They really are. Get out. Get out. I need an exorcism. <laughs> All right. Tim, what was your next term? Are you ready for me to pile on? Yeah. Yeah. Because this has got to be on everybody's list. eBay one of one. Oh, that was mine. That was my next one. Yeah. Yes. All right. Totally. Well, good. Yeah. Totally. Because I see that I've seen actual people on social media ask the question about eBay one of ones, thinking that it actually was something. Like, hey, I've seen this, and obviously these are people that are new to the hobby, specifically. Because they, they see this and they're like, what does that actually mean? Well, you know, if you want to break it down to what it actually means, it means that the seller is, pardon my French, a douche. That's what it means. Because anybody that puts that in their title and it's not actually numbered, serial numbered, stamped, written on, whatever, 
as one of one, one slash one or one of one or however they want to display it. If it's just something that they put in their title to grab somebody's attention and try to make their thing stand out more than somebody else's thing, it's dumb. It's a big waste of time and just it's it's stupid. And I get it. It's an advertising piece, just like sticking a bunch of sirens and flames in your title for whatever it is you're selling. It's going to get people to look like, oh, look, pretty flames. No, it's nothing. It means nothing. It is nothing. So you making up a category. Oh, it's an eBay one of one because there's none like it. Look, this is number 33 out of 50 and his number is 33. It's an eBay one of one. Uh, it makes me crazy. It's it's stupid. And most of the time, if I ever see it, I just ignore. I did for a while. I know this, is, this sounds horrible, but for a while, if people had like make me an offer buttons and they, they put eBay one of one and it wasn't one of one, I'd offer a dollar. No one ever took my offer, though. I don't know why. Oh, weird. Why do you hate eBay one of them? Come on. I hate it because when I didn't know what it was at first, so I was like, wait, so is it a one-on-one -on -one card? Like, exactly. And I hate it because now if I'm at a show and someone's got this, like, really interesting card, like, you're right, like, the number matches the jer the guy's jersey number, they'll go, oh, that could be an eBay one of one. I'm like, oh. So it doesn't even need to be on eBay to be an eBay one-on-one, -on -one, but it could be even when we're in the real world. And it, it's really annoying. And it, it causes confusion for people who are new, who don't know what, what it is. And it's not accurate. And it's supposed to be, do people actually search that term on eBay that you would put it in the heading? I don't even know. Or it's supposed to get you to look there. It doesn't work for me. I, I actually, if I see that, I keep scrolling. So. It's the opposite. Maybe it works for these other people who who are interested in that kind of terminology, but I'm not. So that's why I hate it. Here's the sad part about all of this. If you go on eBay and you just search eBay one of one, like one slash one. Yeah, what happens? Oh, you'll you'll get a result for like ten thousand items. Of course. That's crazy. Now not all of them say eBay one of one, but the vast majority of them do. If you hate somebody, take their phone and make that their alert on eBay. And then, you know, because it would be like your, fo your phone would explode. <laughs> <you know? laughs> but yeah. It's a dumb terminology. And all it is, is it's a marketing. It's it's clickbait. It's clickbait for eBay. That's exactly what it is. But I don't blame, but I don't blame eBay because I, I can't imagine they, somebody coined this phrase and then people use it. eBay doesn't even know what it is, I'm sure. You're like, Oh, this number, this card's numbered out of 50. Oh, this is one out of 50. It's an eBay one of one because it's the first one made. No, it isn't. It's just number one out of a group of numbers. Do you understand how cards are manufactured? <laughs> they come out on a sheet. They come out at the same time. This wasn't made first. Everything in that whole entire row across the page was made first because it came out of the machine at the same time. Oh, I have number 75 out of 75. Oh, it's an eBay one of one. No, it isn't. There's 74 more of them. Wait, so you're saying if Holy Grail doesn't exist, eBay one of one doesn't exist either. It's a made up term. It's not real. Well, a lot of these terms are made up to promote or hype or whatever, like pack fresh or case fresh. Right. So I think we should mention the fire emoji, even though it's an emoji, but it still does get overused a lot, whether it's in the title of an eBay listing or it's somebody responding to somebody's hits when they put their hits on like Twitter X, you know, Oh, look at what I got in my, my case of series two. And then somebody replies with like a bunch of fire emojis. Well, not only that, but people also talk that way now. So they'll be like, you show someone a card and then someone will go, wow, that's fire. You know, and it's like, so now you talk like an emoji. Great. Right, like saying LOL. Right, it's like, well, either you laugh or you don't. Like what, you say LOL. Right, yeah. I lolled pretty hard at that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's like the first time I was, I was, um, who was it? It was, I'm trying to remember. Remember AOL Instant Messenger? Oh, yeah. I was just thinking about that today. That little boing 
the sound you'd get when you get a notification. So I remember I was I was talking with my Uncle John, who, who has since passed away. But I remember he texted me. We were talking about the Lord of the Rings movies because he was a big fan of Tolkien. So I was asking him what he thought about it. And we're just messaging each other back and forth. This is still in like the dial-up days, right? So just having a conversation online is just fun, right? We're geeking out about Lord of the Rings. And I said something and he responded, R-O-T-F-L-M-A-O. And I'm like, what? (laughs) And then he responds, he, he types in, rolling on the floor, laughing my ass off. And I'm just thinking... You're not really doing that, though, right? Like, you're not really rolling on the floor laughing your ass off. Only the Tickle Me Elmo TMX does that, right? If you remember the the second Tickle Me Elmo, that would actually roll around on the floor. Seriously, it was a toy. What if he actually was, and that's how he got that combination of letters onto the screen, (laughs) is he rolled over the keyboard. It's like, "Ah, right, exactly. randomly hit them. You just reminded me, that could be, if if, if someone texted me that today i would think they sent me their password for something i would not know what that was it's like (laughs) what is that yeah i know so yeah like the you're not really rolling on the floor you're not really laughing out loud loud like yeah omg you don't even believe in god so stop just stop so omg and then fire emoji at the same time you 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 would throw your phone across the room you're like forget it yeah i'm done as tim would say if you're done on that one, I got another one that might set you off too. Okay. This has come around in the last few years because I never heard it probably prior to COVID. I never heard anybody say this term, but it's come around now and people say it all the time, especially if you're trying to buy something mm-hmm. on the hobby universe on X or on Facebook or something. And that's the phrase net to me. Hate it. I've never heard of it. What does it mean? People say it all the time. Net to me. Like, this is what they want. They want the 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 number that you're going to pay them to be that number. Like, so they say net to me. Oh, I see. So, for instance, if I'm selling you a card for $20 and you, for some reason, don't trust me because I'm some rando dude on Facebook as most people are, I don't want to send $20 to you friends and family and have you skunk me out of whatever it is I'm trying to buy from you. So therefore, I'm going to pay you goods and service. Well, skunk dude on Facebook doesn't want to pay the goods and service fees. So he wants you to pay them. So therefore, he says, well, I need this to be $20 net to me. Which means then you have to do the dumb math in your own head to figure out, okay, what are his service fees going to cost him? And I have to calculate it in my head and then pay him $23.96 to cover all of his fees that he's going to have to pay on the back end. Stop using this term. Whatever you want the number to be, just say your number. That's it. No net to me crap. No after fees. No, none of that. I'm not calculating anything. If you say net to me, we're done. We're done here. And we're moving on. And I'm going on to something else because it's so dumb. Well, it's dumb for a couple of reasons. Well, first of all, yeah, it's just a dumb phrase. But I kind of resent that people want to be a business without incurring any business expenses. Now I get that there's ways to skirt around certain things, but like, I'll give you like, for instance, when somebody's selling a card for $22, you know that they really want $20 for the card, but then they're figuring that they're going to spend $2 like PWE shipping, you know, the, the top loader, the penny sleeve, the team bag, the envelope, the stamp, maybe even the upcharge for non-machinable or if it's over an ounce or whatever, right? So like when they're saying, oh, 21 shipped PWE, it's like, come on, dude, just do 20, right? They're always trying to like figure out how to get it so that they're going to clear this much or like you say, net to them. But yeah, I kind of resent that because it's like, yeah, if you don't know rando skunk or person, whatever on the internet, yeah, you want to do the goods and services. Like, 
this guy wanted, he was, what was he selling? He had something, he was advertising on Twitter. He had a couple of cards. He had a Gretzky rookie that I wanted. And I agreed to the price. And I said, I will buy that Gretzky rookie off of you because I am in the market for one. And that looks nice. I will live with that condition. It was graded and I, I'm happy to pay that price. And he said, well, friends and family only. And I said, well, one dude, one dude, this is an expensive purchase, so no. And two, you're in Canada, I'm in the U.S., and I don't even think that's possible with the exchange rate and whatnot. So I said, here's what I will do. I will pay extra. I'll make it goods and services. I will pay the fees. I will figure out what the fees are so that the net to you, even though I didn't know that term at the time, so I didn't use it, but even so that he would still net what he wanted. And he's like, nope, it's got to be friends and family or I'm not selling it. And I'm just like, all right, you're a scam. I know what people are doing. I mean, they're trying to avoid the uh, not only the fees directly from you know, the services, but they're trying to avoid the fees on the back end when they end up getting their... 1099, yeah, for over $600. Yeah, they're 1099 from selling. Yeah. So, you know, different states have kicked at it to different levels and whatever and have their own rules and some haven't even started it yet. But it's coming and people are going to get that and you sell so much and there it is. It is what it is. Like you said, they're trying to be a business without being a business. And I have other things to say about that, too, but I'll save that for a later time. But yeah. And by the way, it used to be called the cost of doing business, which meant you know, as a business person, you know, it's like, yeah, I got to, I got to eat the stamp. Okay. Whatever. But I make $20, you know, whatever. Yeah. Because these people aren't business people. They're, they're just looking to maybe capitalize on everything else. I mean, there's people on eBay, for example, that will even overcharge shipping. I've had people you know, charge $4 or $3 and I get it. It's like you put it in a white envelope. Why did I pay $4 for that? Now, thankfully, eBay has made it a lot easier and incentivized cheaper you know postage but it, it was silly it's like this is like a couple of common cards or whatever it was it wasn't an expensive card but don't charge me if you charge me three dollars for shipping then pay three dollars for shipping you know and i feel like they, they think they're pulling one over on you by making an extra dollar now on you it's annoying when people say net to me it has me literally shaking <laughs> oh that's that's a good one literally shaking that's a good one yeah you know, another good one or bad one. I hate that phrase. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Literally shaking. Cause it's like, dude, it's a, it's a piece of cardboard. Settle down, settle down. It's a piece of cardboard. You got me shaking. You're shaking. Why? Is this like a life changing card that you just pulled? Is this like the, the card you've been chasing your whole life? No, it hasn't. Cause it's not going in your collection. You're turning around and selling it. Dude. It's the Bedard gold one of one young gun. Yeah. So they'd be literally shaking. Unfortunately, they sent it to PSA and it came a six. So there you go. Sorry, no million dollars for you. No, 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 no. If I, if I pulled that card, I would tell Dave and Adams, here it is. You can buy it. I'd be like, screw the million. I'll sell it to you for eight fifty right now. <laughs> no, they can pay to get it graded. I'm not going to pay to get it graded. If I'm going to sell it to them, they can buy it and grade it themselves. Well, yeah, because you already know what it what it's worth. It's worth a million dollars. Right, right. What's PSA going to charge you at that point? Well, they use a sliding scale based on the value of the card so as to uh, offset the cost of the blah, blah, blah. Nonsense. Is it percentage? Yeah, because the card doesn't have any value in the sense that it's only one of one. There's no comps, which is another term I hate. But anyway, you know, there's no comps on it. And so, because David Adams thinks it's worth a million dollars, what would PSA charge? That's a that's a great question. I mean, that's the price tag on it. If somebody finds it, you have a it's a million dollars. Somebody's willing to pay a million. So they say, yeah. assuming it's in that condition. Right. So it would behoove PSA to grade it in one of those positions because then they can then use that as marketing for the rest of their freaking lives to say, we graded the million dollar card. Also, it'd be funny if like there's a dinged corner on that card. But it's packed fresh, so it can't be. It's packed fresh. <laughs> Pack fresh six. Packed fresh. But it looks like a seven. Yeah, enough alcohol. Any six looks like a seven. 
This coming from the guy who thought an RPA was a type of a beer. Yeah, so <laughs> you, you so you made a lot of drinking references tonight that you don't know what you're talking about. So don't worry. <laughs> I had fun friends in college. What yeah. can I say? Sal is a true eBay one of one when it comes to alcohol. Yeah. No, you know, the thing was, I was never a big drinker. I was a social drinker. And when you're in college, you're around other yeah. people who also drink. So you just tend to do it to sometimes to fit in a little bit. But sometimes you find a drink that you like. My favorite was rum and Coke. Why? Because if I started to feel sick, I would just have Coke. And people thought I was still drinking rum and Coke, right? And you just don't say anything. And you just... Sip it, you know, keep sipping it, right? Well, now we know your trick, Sal. No. Yeah, exactly. It, this isn't rum and coke. This is coke and coke. <laughs> and not the fun kind. When people <laughs> always tell me that they only drink in college, like socially in, in college, when people tell me that stuff and that they don't drink anymore, it makes me immediately think that all they drank was Natty Ice and Apple Pucker. <laughs> and what? No, it. dude. <laughs> and Goldschlager. Like one of those three. Nope. Woodchuck Draft Cider was my drink of choice in college. Well, that replaces the Apple Pucker. Okay. And then um, Jägermeister. Ooh, that's, well, that's, that's rough. Pretty close to Goldschlager. Vodka with orange juice. So screwdrivers, that was like another go-to because it was cheap and easy to make. And then rum and Coke. That's fair. That's yeah. fair. Yeah. I yeah. mean, rum and Coke or screwdrivers to look a little more respectable, but would chuck when i just wanted to drink a drink that i actually enjoyed drinking if we were buying beer and we went to the liquor store anything we bought had to come from the cooler as far to the left as you could get yeah if it was I, in I that cooler that was our speed so like keystone steel reserve some mickeys uh Mickey's you Jesus. know any of the natty versions that were in there i mean we'd even go as far as grabbing some old milwaukee's and stuff like that so that was the go-to because nobody had any money so we had to go the cheapest we could <laughs> well clemente might as well just yeah we're uh, yeah we're I, remember, here. I remember a lot of rolling rock which was you know <laughs> rolling rock that's, that's that was one. another one that was very affordable without you know, stooping to the level of like a Budweiser, you know, which we would touch, but um, anyway. <laughs> oh, I got one. I got one for you. Are you ready? Zima. Oh, that's old school. Barlton James. Zima. <laughs> I'll tell you what. Zima with a Jolly Rancher dropped in it. I mean, really? who who didn't live off of those for a while? Yeah, Zima was a good go-to drink. Yeah, yeah. I, I think it was kind of like the Mike's Hard Lemonade of its time. Correct, yeah. Yeah, well, actually, the original one was Barles and James. It was, like, it was like a wine cooler of some sort. Yeah, the wine cooler. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. We had tons of those in yeah. college because, yeah. you know, well, no, you, if, if you want the girls to come over, you got to have drinks that the girls like. So wine coolers were, you know, right. versus like beer. Yeah, you beer know, was like, a guy thing. Like, yeah, exactly. For sports. Yeah. 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 You got to have choices for everybody. Yeah. But uh, getting back on uh, one last term I want to throw out real quick. Raz, hate it. Just say illegal raffle. I mean, that's straight up. Raz. Raz. Because I'll see something. I'll go, oh, that's a nice card. $20. That can't be right. Oh, it's a Raz. Okay. Oh, you're still. Yeah. Two, so $20 times, you know, 20 spots. And they go, okay, cool, man. You're making $400 on this card that's worth like 100 or maybe 200 You know, you know like. Eh, okay, I like that. You know, maybe I'll raz one of my Gretzky rookies for ten dollars a spot and sell a thousand spots. Right? Might be worth it. Right? You could win this for ten bucks. Raffle, illegal raffle. Sorry. And that's the terminology is to avoid the flags. That's all it was. It was created to avoid the flags because raffles are illegal. They're games of chance. You throw those on eBay, you're going to get taken down. And so if you put Raz, chances of them finding you aren't as quick. But any games of chance, they violate their policy. So right off the bat, they're not out there checking every single one of these. And unless people actually are reporting them, they kind of go undetected sometimes. But Razzes are everywhere on social media. I mean, they're all over the place. It's rampant. And it's like okay, we got this many spots and then we have this many half spots and then we have this many quarter spots. It's like, 
I don't want to pay for a full spot. So I'm going to pay for like a quarter spot. So if you get enough quarter spots, then you spin the wheel and all those quarter spots get loaded into the thing and they give out free spots for people that paid for a quarter. So you're getting for a quarter of the price, you're getting a full spot. It's like, this is becoming way too complicated. Either sell the damn card or don't sell the card because this is ridiculous, but it's everywhere. And people swear by them. They're all over the place. I see them in my feed almost every single day. And it's like the same people running them. And it's the same people jumping in them. And they all swear by it. And it's like this weird cult. I agree. I don't like it. It's not that I don't like the term. I don't like the thing. It is. That it is. Yeah, okay. So maybe we don't really dislike the term. We just hate what it means. So yeah. I, I get it. Yeah. Get rid of the term and get rid of the thing. Yeah. Or just call the thing what it actually is. It's a raffle. It's an illegal game of chance. Okay, guys. This uh, podcast has gotten a bit long, and I feel like we could probably uh, rant about things until the wee hours of the night. So any last words you want to throw out there before we wrap it up and call it a show? No. I have nothing else to say. We've said everything we can, I think, without making us a five-hour podcast, so. Yeah, I think we can always revisit this, especially based on any feedback that we get from our listeners. I know on Facebook, on the Puck Junk Facebook group, which I'll put a link to in the comments if you want to join, some people were responding to the link to Tim's article with their own hobby terms that they don't like. So this definitely is a topic that we could revisit maybe during the summer months, that slow off season you know, after the draft and free agency, and now we have nothing in until training camp. Maybe we create a, we'll call it the hobby craptionary. It's all words that we can't stand and hate in their definitions. Mm, we'll have to work on the title. Yeah, that wasn't solid. That was, <laughs> no. was hard. I'll think about that for a while. Yeah, we'll, we'll workshop it, as they say in, in writing classes. We'll, we'll workshop on it and... Uh, and get back to you with the with a better title. Or the term I hate for that, which is crowdsourcing. Ooh, <laughs> yeah, that's a good one. Okay. We've talked about crowdsourcing. We've talked about raffles. We've talked about our drinks of choice in college. So I think this is at the point where we just say, okay, they're delirious. We need to end the show now. So thank you for listening to the Puck Junk Hockey Podcast. As always, if you've enjoyed this show, please be sure to like and subscribe. Please write us a review wherever you listen to this podcast because you know what? Stuff like that helps with getting us higher up in the ranks. Every review and rating helps. If you'd like to support this podcast, you can do so by purchasing a t-shirt at shop.puckjunk.com. And if you'd like to read, subscribe to our newsletter at puckjunk.com slash newsletter. And until next time, collect what you like. For more hockey goodness, follow us on Twitter at PuckJunk.